Welcome to the lecture, Who Needs a Splint and Why? Um, this lecture can be seen as a standalone and you can just watch it and forget me, or you can listen to this lecture and eventually understand why I've been doing this series of courses. Um, the lecture is created to create in your mind an understanding of how the system functions and how, it's, how it degrades and basically why people may need a splint. Um, we're going to go through a little bit of theory at first, see how the jaw functions, how the joint functions, uh, how that leads to changes in the bite, how different things that happen in the joint, like a disc displacement, how that leads to changes in the bite, why that can be important, the consequences are going to be. Um, I'll do just a little bit of theory to explain how that functions, and then we're going to see cases. So the the big part of the the main part of the lecture is looking at cases looking at mouths so we can understand actually what happens when things go wrong up back in the joint and how the how the joint can actually influence the system all right so let's go so basically as usual, there's a disclaimer. You should be aware of the potential risk of using limited knowledge when incorporating new techniques in your practice. Again, this is not a course, it's just a lecture. Uh, and I have no commercial ties uh, other than, of course, uh, if you buy the course, I'm paid because you buy the course. Um, but if you, uh, but whatever I talk about in the course, I am not paid to talk about any different uh, product or whatever. I'm not paid for that. I have no commercial ties. So, um, this is one of the things that started me off. Uh, um, when I was in dental school, I did a, after the dental after dental school, I went a, through a residency program. And back then, we used to do a prosthesis. And we used to, I, I did my first full mouth rehab as a resident after in year one as a dentist. Um, it gave me a new, another perspective that we, we'd seen in dental school. So it gave me a more, oh, a, a more of a complete view type of, of a way of seeing the mouth. So I stopped just looking at teeth as individuals and stopped, started looking at the system as a whole. And that really pushed my practice to another level. Um, so th again, this course is intended to help you understand what goes on in the mouth, all those bites you see every day that are off, that are offset, understanding what they're there for, uh, what, why they're there, I should say. So um, this slide is called the brain the eyes can't see what the brain doesn't know. So I'm going to try and put things in your brain that um, are going to lead to the fact that when you look in mouths, you're going to understand what's going on. So let's go. Now, uh, in the general intro, I spoke of, I spoke of an article by, uh, by, uh, by Peter Unger, the anthropologist that was published in Scientific American on actually April 1st of 2020. 2020. Um, you should definitely read this article. You, you go pick up this article. Uh, it's it's on the internet. Uh, it's online. Go read it. It takes uh, it's a 10-15 minute read, and it really explains in the best possible way uh, why mouths are like they are today. Actually, this article, this this anthropologist is the one that explained the best why I have why I personally have so much work to do, and why I created this course. Uh, please read the article. It's a 10 minute read. It's fine. Uh, it's just, a, it's just well written and great. It explains perfectly why people are in the state they are with their mouths today. Now, uh, growth problems and malocclusions, like where do they come from? Well, they come from all sorts of things, but, uh, one of the main sources is the joint. So one of the most frequent and less suspected causes of joint de of jaw development problems is actually the temporomandibular joint. Now, that joint is like any other joint of the body. It has growth defects and it has uh, pathology. So we're going to go a little bit through both, but both lead to occlusal changes. When the seating of the joint changes, the bite shifts. Like you probably noticed that nobody that's age 80 has the same mouth that they had at age 20. 
I mean, mouths change with time, and there's reasons for that. And when we're going to we're going to explore one of those reasons, which is probably the, one of the main reasons, which is what's going on within the joint through our lives, throughout our lives. Now. When I talk about disc displacement, people often think, yeah, well, that's a small percentage of the population. Well, no, I'm sorry, it's not. There was an article came out by an orthodontist called Brian Nebbe, and that came out in the Angle Orthodontist in, 20, in 2000, actually, in December 2000. It's been 20-some years that it's been published. And it's called Prevalence of TMJ Dis Displacement in a Pre-Orthodontic Adolescent Sample. And the results of that are astounding. If you look at the numbers, uh, in boys of age 13 to 15, there are only 40% of discs that are in place. 60% of their discs are out of place, and they're like 13 to 15. And in girls, it's just wild. I mean, boys is already incredible, but girls is just wild. At age 13 to 15, there's only 20, an average of 25% of discs that are still in place. 75% of girls pre-orthodontic have displaced discs. Um, there, there are reasons for that. I mean, growth and development today isn't like, like it used to be. I, in the article by Peter Unger, he suspects that chewing is one of our problems. We don't chew hard foods anymore. And he suspects that's one of the problems with the fragility of the system and especially of the joint. And you know as well as I do that we have the disc and the joint and the ligaments around the disc that hold the disc in place. And those ligaments are, are, have become very fragile. And so even minute traumas today are susceptible of leading to stretching and tearing of the ligaments and then the disc in displace. Uh, let's have a look at what a joint looks like. So on the left hand of the screen, you have the condyle that I'm outlining now, and you have the disc, of course, and the fossa and the eminence, and the lateral pterygoid muscles. In the middle of the screen, you have what a normal joint looks like on a cadaver cut. So you have the condyle, and you have up here the fossa and the eminence, and you have the disc here that has this biconcave shake, a little bit like a bow tie. Um, uh, this condyle is in seated, so this is a protruded position or an open mouth position with the condyle underneath the eminence. On the right hand of the screen, you have an MRI of a joint. So you have uh, the condyle that I'm outlining here, and the cortical layer here on an MRI is black. So you have to try and imagine that a five-year-old with a felt pen actually went over the cortical layers that we're used to seeing as white, so, and the, the child just made black markings. So again, this is the outline of the condyle. This is the ear canal. This is the tympanic plate. And this is the fossa outline and the eminence outline. Now the disc is in between the two here, so outline the condyle outline the eminence and the fossa, and in the space between the two, this is where we find the disc. So the disc is this black dot here, the fine line in the middle, and the black dot here. So this is the posterior band, and what we also call the foot of the disc. Now, if you take the condyle as a clock, and this is considered noon, uh, the disc, the posterior band of the disc, the most distal part, most posterior part of the disc, should be at approximately 1 o'clock, 12.30 to 1 o'clock. This is a normal disc position. Um, I really want you to have a good look at the disc, its shape and where it is, and I want you to have a good look at the condyle. Now, the condyle here is normal, and this is one of the rare ones that I have which is normal. Um, the condyle here, if you look at the cortex, it's even. It's about 1.5 to 2 millimeters in thickness, pretty even all around, rounded on the top. The marrow is grayish. The condyle is about 10 millimeters wide from posterior to anterior. Uh, you can see it has an angle. Marrow is relatively uniform in its grayishness. And uh, this is just a good-looking condyle. This is how they're supposed to be. 
and it's the last normal one you're going to be seeing today. So in the cases we're going to be showing, they're all going to be degraded. Um, all right, so let's go to the videos. We're going to animate here uh, in the cadaver cuts different, different stages of this displacement. So, now, here what you're seeing is the condyle and the disc in their normal function. So you're seeing the condyle that I'm outlining here and the disc that you can very well see here and they're functioning together in a normal way. So when the condyle and the disc are in their normal position and their normal relationship, this is how things function. So you get the <coughs> condyle, it's totally seated here, and then you have the condyle underneath the eminence. So the condyle is this seated, is seated on the, on the posterior band of the disc when the mouth is closed, and it comes to the center of the disc when the mouth is open or you're in a protruded position. All right. Second video we're looking at is a disc displacement. Now, it's an anterior disc displacement, but what we call with reduction. Basically, that means that the ligaments that are holding the disc have been stretched or slightly torn, and the disc has moved a little bit, and the posterior band of the disc is now a little bit further down in front of the condyle. As the patient opens their mouth, you're going to see the condyle come down underneath the disc, and at the same time, the disc is going to pop up back on the condyle. So when you hear a click, that's what's going on. But this doesn't always make a click. So there's a lot of this going on without any audible noise or even without even the patient feeling it. So let's look at the video, and we're going to see here the condyle, and here's the disc, and you just saw it pop. We're going to see that again. So the condyle, when it goes back into its fully seated position, is off the disc. It's on the retrodiscal tissue that is stretched over the disc, uh, over the condyle. So the disc is here. Retrodiscal tissue is here. Now the condyle is seating on the retrodiscal tissue. And as the patient opens their mouth or protrudes, then the disc pops back onto the condyle as the condyle gets back into the middle of the disc. And again, this is the classical, when you hear a sound, this is a classical clicking sound. Uh, this, this is often a muscle pain stage for patients. Uh, the, these joints are not often painful. Sometimes there are, but the muscles are often painful because this offsets the bite. All right, now we're going to do anterior disc displacement without reduction. Now, that means that the disc that's over the condyle and went a little bit further, and then you had the stage of with reduction, the disc keep pro kept progressing and went a little bit further out, and now the condyle is just pushing the disc even further. So you're, the condyle can't get underneath the disc anymore, and the disc can't get over the condyle anymore. So now you have a situation where the condyle, again, is just pushing the disc, and this is called anterior disc displacement without reduction. So, let's look at that. So, as you see on the screen now, you see the condyle and you see the retrodiscal tissue over it and you see the disc in front that's almost folded in half. So, the condyle is not rubbing against the bone. So, there's still that retrodiscal tissue stretched over the condyle that's giving some level of protection. Uh, this is more often a joint pain type of situation. Uh, you'll see more joint pain in this situation. Again, still you can have some muscle pain. Um, and the condyle just does not get back into the disc. It's just pushing it out further and further. And as this happens, you, this, is the, this is a great stage for a night guard because it takes some loading off the, off the condyle and it can prevent the retrodiscal tissue from perforating in some circumstances, and you can prevent some osteoarthritis from happening or progressing. All right, so let's go look at the next video. In this stage, the retrodiscal tissue has perforated, so we're going to look at osteoarthritis now. So it's bone to bone. 
So the retrodiscal tissue has perforated. And let's look at this. And now you see the condyle here that's totally flattened out. So is the eminence. The disc is rolled up in a ball in front here. And you can actually see the capsule here being totally stretched out. There's no retrodiscal tissue left at all. It is totally bunched up in the back here. It's totally torn, it's sectioned totally. So there, there, there's nothing protecting the two bones from rubbing together anymore. And this is severe osteoarthritis. Now, imagine that, imagine what happened to the jaw position, the jawbone position. Um, as the disc moved out of place, that lopsided a bit. As the condyle wore down, that made it shift even more. And you'll often see that as an asymmetry or as a midline shift. Now, let's go to the next videos. And now in, this, in, in these videos, we're going to see exactly the same four stages as we did before, but we're going to see them on MRI. So in this first animation, you're going to see the condyle and the disc, and just the condyle, as, it, as the mouth opens, the condyle is just going to go into the disc, and that's all we're going to see. So you're seeing the condyle rubbing into the disc, and that's quick and simple, so we're going to do it over. And again, the condyle is just rubbing into the disc, and that's normal condyle disc function. Next video, and let me outline here the condyle. That's good. And this is the ear canal in the back. And then you have the fossa and the eminence. And the disc is a little bit harder to see. It's a little bit like a, it looks like a butterfly. And, and it looks like an ink blob type of butterfly. So this grayish area here and this grayish area there, little ditch in the two. So that's how it looks like a butterfly. That's the disc. And you're going to see the condyle come into the middle of the disc. So this is anterior disc displacement with reduction. So as that goes on, you can see the condyle coming into the middle of the disc. And again, it's anterior disc displacement with reduction. And again, this is when you hear a click, this is what's going on. But this does not always produce a sound. So don't think that if it doesn't click that this is not what's happening. You don't know until you have an MRI. All right, that's good. Let's go to the next. In the next video, you have the condyle here, and you have <clears throat> the disc that's all the way out in front. And this time, the condyle is just going to push the disc even further out. So, let's see that. So you're going to see the condyle pushing the disc, and the disc is just going to bunch up in front of the condyle. So here there's no more clicking sound. So typically if you had a patient that said, I had a click for a number of years and then it stopped clicking, clicking, it didn't really get better. Typically it got worse. So this is a stage that often leads to perforation and bone-to-bone -bone contact and osteoarthritis. And it's time we look at that. Now, on this video, you're looking at the condyle here. So let me outline the condyle. Now, it is not smooth. It's not easy to see. This is a raggedy condyle. Now, uh, the ear canal is way out here. And this is the outline of the fossa and eventually the eminence. The disc is this sort of weird triangle here. here that's what it is. When I start this video, you're going to see the condyle just push the disc further, and you're going to see the two bones rubbing together. So let's look at that. So you can see the condyle rubbing against the eminence on the fossa, and it's just pushing the disc way out, and this is osteoarthritis, and this often sounds, patients will tell you I have like sandpaper in my ear, or sandpaper in my joint. All right. This animation is going to show what happens when the joint, de when the joint degrades. So let's look at this. Um, you uh, see here, we're outlining the condyle and the disc. And if you look at the occlusion, you're going to see this is a nice class one occlusion at the molar, at the canine. 
midlines are centered, same thing on the other side, your class one molar, class one canine, the coupling of the teeth is beautiful, everything is equal, everything is set perfectly like it's supposed to be. Now, this is a class one patient. Now, you just saw the disc get displaced, and what happened to the condyle? It went up. We're going to see that again. Disc gets displaced, condyle goes, condyle goes up. What happened to the bite? We're going to see it one more time. Now, this time, look at the tooth level. Look at the molars. When the disc displaces, the molars are pulled back as the condyle goes up. And this is creating a more class two relationship and this creation of interferences. And it also created a midline shift. Try and guess which side it went to. Of course, it went to the bad side. And we're going to be looking at that. And now you can see that midline that shifted a bit. And you can see that the coupling shifted to the left. So the, it, the canines are tighter on the left and looser on the right now. And if we start preventing some growth from happening, if we create some degradation, osteoarthritis, that bite's just going to shift more and more towards the affected side. So if you look at the midline shift now, you see it's much accentuated. So we had like a half a millimeter. Now we're up to close to two millimeters shift with shortening just a little bit of the condyle. So what did that do to the bite? This is the type of patient that says, yeah, I, I close on one side and I can, almost can't close my teeth on the other. I have to warp my jaw to close, close my teeth on the other side. So some patients develop open bites and some patients adapt. And now we're looking at a patient that's adapting. Let's look at how the adaptation happens. And so the teeth will extrude until they adapt. But what do we have now? We have this absolutely classical class two. And we didn't alter the maxillas. We didn't alter the body of the mandible. We didn't alter the body of the maxilla. All we did is change in one joint. We displaced the disc and we created some either reduced growth or osteoarthritic degeneration of the condyle. And we produced a classical class two occlusion. Now, I present this to illustrate and to put in your minds that a lot of these poor bites we're seeing are actually of joint origin. Not all of them, but a lot of them. So actually, it's the majority of them. When you start looking, it's the majority of them. So when you look at your patient's mouths, try and understand what's going on in the joint in the back. Try and understand how the mouth got that way. Uh, and of course, there's airway issues and there's thin palates that come from poor airways. And there's all sorts of other things going on at the same time but always have a look at what's going on with the mandible and the joints. And in a couple of minutes, we're going to be looking at cases, and I'm going to illustrate that. I'm going to show you what to look for. All right. Now, here we're, you're looking at a T-scan image, and the bite's off because one side is short, and the patient's left side is short. You can see that there's almost no condyle there on the left, and there's a nice condyle on the right, uh, well, sorry, it's it, on the left hand of the screen. Patient's right hand has no condyle. Patient's left side has a good condyle. And the, the occlusion is totally warped. And it's if you look at the T-scan image on the bottom, you can see there's a lot more occlusion on one side than the other. And guess which side gets the most wear and tear? And the problem here is that as the joint degrades, the bite shifts to that side. Now you get more pressure on the teeth, but you also get more pressure on the joint. So when that disc eventually moves out of place, well, actually the fact that you have more pressure on a displaced disc pushes the disc further even more and more, like a little uh, kidney bean type of thing. Or if, you're, um, if the disc is totally out, and then you have that thin tissue there. You can actually perforate the tissue with the excessive pressure. And once the tissue is perforated, then you get the osteoarthritis going on. And you get that joint wearing down more and more. And the more this degrades, the more it's going to shift. The more it's, well, sorry, the more it shifts, the more it's going to put pressure on the joint. And the more it's going to degrade. You get the vicious circle that's going on there. 
So this is the typical thing that happens in your everyday patient. Doesn't always get as bad as that. And you have a lot of early stages of these problems, but the bites are very often off because of, at least partly because of what's going on within the joint, joint or joints. All right. Now, in the mouth, when you have, uh, yeah, I, I, and this is the introduction to who needs a splint and why. Now, when you look in patient's mouths, these are signs of excessive loading or excessive pressure. Attrition, cracked teeth, recessions, ab fractions, mobility, sensitive teeth, tense muscles, headache, neck pain, and painful joints. Now, where do they come from? We just saw one of the major causes of all of this. What percentage of your patients have these defects in, in their mouth? What percentage of your patients actually don't have any signs of wear and tear? If you guys are like me, not that many. So a lot of patients, most of our patients, I'd say like 98%. You have the percentage you have, but in my practice it was about 98% of patients had signs of wear and tear I could attribute to having mechanical imbalance in the mouth. The fact that things are not perfect. All right. Now, let's have a look at a few cases and let's illustrate all of this. Now, if you look at this patient's mouth, you can see that the left side ramus is shorter than the right side ramus. We just saw that case. Well, the same but on the opposite side. Which condyle is smaller? Which one is, has osteoarthritic damage? Well, if you look at the mouth, you can see how far the midline shifted towards the short side. And the midline shifted because that's the short side. I mean, you have no choice. It's mechanical. One leg is shorter than the other. You're going to be unbalanced. That's obvious. Now, this patient lost two molars. Where did the pressure go to? Well, as the mandible shifts, the pressure is going to the back teeth on that side, and you're actually getting more pressure on those molars. So what happened? Well, they eventually cracked and eventually got crowns and eventually got root canals and eventually split the roots and eventually got extracted. And this all happened in a 40-year period. So the patient consulted for implants, but the surgeon didn't want to put the implants in because of the severe osteoarthritis in the left joint. And there you have it. Now, if you look at the panoramic image, you can see the right joint isn't so bad. The condyle is pretty good. But on the left side, you, you can see a small flattened out condyle. And where's the pressure? Well, it's all back here and up there. So this, is, this illustrates exactly what we've been talking about. So this patient's bite was off. She was also having headaches and tension. So we did a splint, we did a night guard. And that calmed the headaches down, and eventually we equilibrated her bite, and now she's fully comfortable again, and she's balanced, and she's stable. We've been following her for about six, seven years. Nothing has changed. And she eventually did not have implants put in. She chose not to, but she could have had, because she's been stable, and things would have been stable after that. All right. This is an image I really like. This is something I really... Uh, I want my students to learn about and to, I want you to create this type of image in your, in your minds. Look at the mouth and then look at the panoramic image and superimpose the two. Look at how that bite was produced by those joints. And if you start doing this, you're going to see them. I mean, if you're not used to looking at this, start doing it. Do a panorex party at the office tomorrow morning or whenever you go back to, to the office and look at those panoramic images and look at those patient's pictures or when they have the patient with you, look at those mouths, look at the image, and you're going to start making associations. You're going to start understanding how these things happen. All right, this is her MRI, and so you can see the condyle being outlined here, and the disc is totally out of place way out there. And on the other side, same thing, the condyle is short, 
and it is osteoarthritic. It's flattened out. There's an osteophyte way out here, and you have the disc way out here, completely non-reducing. All right. So she's doing pretty good now. She's good. She's happy. She's stable. Now, case number two. Now, this man has a strong mandible. This, this guy has a really, really strong mandible, and he's tore, he tore away his first rehab. So this rehab was done about 15 years ago, and he had headaches, and he tore away at it and ground his teeth and ground his crowns away and broke a couple, broke a couple of teeth, needed a few implants, got those done, and eventually came to me. Now, his joints are good. Uh, his bite was off because the discs were displaced, but the condyles were good and they were stable. So he came to us for a, for a full mouth rehab. So we did the wax up. And if you noticed on the first images we saw, he was pretty deep bite. So we decided to open the bite up a little bit and give him less of a deep bite, more of a flat type plane, like on a flat plane splint. And we do that often when we rehab people that have destroyed their mouths. We will give them an anterior guidance that is much flatter, much more like they'd function on a good flat plane night guard. And this is in the temporary stage. And you can see how we always give anterior guidance. So you got the canine guidance going on here. And here you have it in the full mouth rehab. And this patient is just happy. He says he has no more morning headaches, no more morning tension. He's just happy about it because his occlusion is much gentler. Actually, this is like having an integrated night guard. Of course, I gave him a night guard to protect him at night because he's a clencher and he's always going to be a clencher. I'm not going to prevent him from clenching. But at least in the daytime, he's comfortable, he's good, he eats well, and he doesn't feel restricted like he used to. And again, canine guidance in the finals, exactly like it's supposed to be. Everything else discludes. And you can see the before and after pictures. So he's quite happy with the results, both aesthetically and functionally. I actually call this Rehab 2.0 because it's not just beautiful. It's also absolutely perfectly functional. All right. So before and after. And there's no periodontal work here. Absolutely none. This is strictly from opening the bite a little bit and thickening the back of the upper anteriors, creating a flat plane for him. And he's just happy. And he wrote us a nice letter that said he has his balanced smile and he no longer has pain in his neck and his ears and whatever and everything else. And he's really happy about the whole thing. All right. Now, this lady uh, is actually a hygienist and she's married to a dentist. And she's been having headaches forever. Like the, for the past 25 years, she's been in headaches. And look at the wear and tear on those teeth. I mean, look at that lateral. Look at that canine, how they're grooved out. Uh, she's in her early 50s. Uh, so time took a toll on those teeth. She had a beautiful... I, I, I've known her for 35 years. She's married to a friend of mine. And uh, we just saw that dentition. And she wore night guards, but... She just ground her teeth away even during the daytime because she grinds her teeth while she's working as a hygienist. So uh, there is still some good level of destruction. At one point she said, uh, and I, I want my mouth restored. So her husband didn't want to do the work because it's her wife, it's his wife. Uh, he sent her to me and she said, okay, uh, let's do something. So we restored the mouth with the same technique. We opened up the bite just a little bit. We gave a little bit more flattening of the bite. We also gave her another night guard uh, to protect things afterwards. But the important thing here is that she's also extremely comfortable because everything functions with a pure anterior guidance. I didn't say it before, but she had major interferences, uh, like the other patient before. They have major interferences. They're locked up in the front, and we just open that up and make them glide, and they're happy. They, they feel much better. And again, if you look, you have incisal guidance going in protrusive, and canine guidance going laterally, and everything else discludes like it's supposed to. Now, it's not just something you read in books. It's something you're supposed to do. And again, I call this Rehab 2.0 because it's not just beautiful. It's also functional and comfortable. And 
what's functional and comfortable, and again, the bite is the same bite I've been teaching for a number of years. Like, we have to understand that we've known, at least for the past 10 years, what's the best bite. And it's not complicated. It's seated condyles, seated joints, and anterior guidance. Seated condyles, seated canines, and anterior guidance. And it's the classical bite, but we know for a fact now, science has demonstrated that it is the bite that yields the least amount of possible stress in the system. It's like walking without pebbles in your shoe. I mean, you're going to, it takes some effort to walk, but it takes a lot more effort to walk with pebbles in your shoe. When you have interferences, it's about the same thing as having pebbles in your shoe. It creates an unbalance. It creates a warping of the jaw position. It, it forces you to use more muscle energy, forces you to, to, it forces your muscles not to work in coordinated pairs. And so you just end up uh, with more muscle tension. And depending on your capacity to adapt to that, well, some people adapt and some people just grind their teeth away because they want to grind those interferences away. Uh, some people are just stressed out and they grind. And, um, and a lot of people just get all this wear and tear because the system is unbalanced. So, all right, when you balance things out, when you equilibrate the dentition, when you rehab with a, with a, a night guard or you rehab with crowns, the principle is the same. Give them the bite that creates the least possible amount of stress in the system. Now, so this patient is a patient we gave a night guard to afterwards because she also she's a clencher. She's still going to be a clencher, but at least in during the daytime, her bite's protected, and during the nighttime, her bite is protected too with a night guard. Okay, this guy. Um, yeah, I want this is something I want to show real specific. Now, yeah, he's missing his anterior teeth. He likes himself as he is. He's a smiley guy. He's kind of the, kind of the happy-go-lucky type of person. He's always happy about everything. There's no problems in life. Um, but what I wanted you to see is the wear and tear on the distal of these upper molars. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I can't get to the distal of my second molars with my lower second molars. I can't get to that. How did he wear them to the gum line? How did he do that? Well, let me show you the panoramic image, and now you can understand. Look at those condyles. There's no condyles left. That's the only way you're going to get those lower molars to hit the distal of the upper molars. Now, as the condyles shrink, the mandible retrudes and then you're going further and further and further back until eventually you can wear those distal aspects of the molars. This gentleman had no pain whatsoever, but he's tearing down his dentition and tearing down his condyles. And again, he's lost his disc. This is severe osteoarthritic damage. He's lucky. He's in absolutely no pain, no muscle pain, no joint pain, no nothing. But everything is breaking down. So it's been classical that we've been taught that joint problems are pain problems. Not true. I mean, pain problems are problems. Yes, yes, absolutely. But when joints have a degradation problem, I mean, discs are displaced or osteoarthritis, what have you, only a small percentage of those patients actually have muscle or joint pain. It's about 8 to 10%. It's the same with osteoarthritis of the knee. Only 8 to 10% of patients actually have pain. The other people live with it without even knowing about it. And so the same principle applies into our system. People have degrading joints they don't know about. And you're there on the front line to look at it, look in the mouth, see the signs of the off bite, and understand where it came from. And now, if you follow this course, you're going to understand what, how to make the proper splints, how to adjust the bites, and you're going to understand how to read the images to understand what's going on. Once you can explain to the patient what's going on, typically a patient that understands is going to be much more prone to doing something. So this course helps in explaining things to the patient, 
in a way that's going to make them understand. Once they understand, they're going to want to do something about the problem as soon as they can. All right. Um, so again, this patient is not in any type of pain, though he's severely degrading, and he, of course, needed a night guard, and he needed some restoration, so his dentist did all of that. And you know, hopefully he's more stable now. And again, yeah, I like this. this. This image is important. Get that image of the teeth superimposed to the panoramic image to understand what's been going on. Okay. Now, this lady, uh, you can see the size of her mandible and you can see the, the hypertrophy of the, of the masseters here. Uh, she had intense muscular fatigue and pain in both joints. And her problem started a long time ago. Like in 2009, her joints seemed pretty good. In 2014, they seemed pretty good. And she had ortho and her teeth were moved around, and then uh, things looked pretty, pretty good in 2014 after her ortho, but eventually the bite shifted. After the ortho, things degraded, and she, had, she relapsed into a new open bite. But what happened? And, and by, from 2019, and from 2019 to 2021, she degraded even more. And if you look at the left side picture here, you can see she's only writing on her right side, on her left side, sorry, on her left side, on the right side of the screen here. So what's going on? Well, look at the left joint on the MRI. MRI, left joint. Now, let's look at the right first. Right side, you can outline the condyle here. You can very well see that cortical layer all around the condyle. And you can see the disc here. And if we go to the left side, no more cortex on the top of that condyle. She's been having severe osteoarthritic damage going on there. And what happened was that everything shifted towards that side. So again, this illustrates what happened in the joint is being reflected in the mouth and it's creating consequences in the mouth. So again, let's imagine the scenario. So she eventually lost her disc and the bones started rubbing together. And even though she had ortho, great ortho, to put her teeth real nice and straight and all of that, well, as the joint continued to degrade, the bite shifted a bit. Then the bite became stronger on this side. The teeth started wearing down and being painful. The muscles started being painful because they were overworking. And then what happened? Then the overworking muscles created even more damage within the joint. And if you're wearing down teeth, that's the hardest tissue in the mouth. Enamel is the hardest thing we have. So if that can wear down, imagine bone to bone. Bone is soft compared to enamel. You all know. So when the bones rub together, they just wear even more. And the more they wear, the more it's going to shift. The more it's going to shift, the more it's going to cause pressure here, the more it's going to cause degradation there. So again, you're in that vicious circle. So that's what's been going on with this patient. So we did the night guard, stabilized it, controlled it. And eventually, we're, we're in the last stages of controlling that now. And eventually, when this joint adapts, then we're going to have to have her done, have to have her go through ortho again, have that redone, just have the bite set up again. But this time her bite's going to be perfectly equilibrated. She's going to have a night guard and we're going to watch her up closely so that hopefully this doesn't happen again. Because, you know, does she really want a total joint re replacement with prosthesis? Hopefully not. All right. Now this case. Uh, look at this one. You have a retruded mandible here. You have a very short ramus on each side. Now, looking at her face, do you think she's closed by deep bite or she, should she be more open bite? Well, you guessed it. She's open bite. And let's look at that. Now, where did that come from? So, two important pieces of information here. You have very short rami and you have an open bite. What gave away? What melted away? She's fully retreated. Look at her images. Now, she came in with this type of splint. Splint had pressure only on the back teeth. Now, did that unload the joints or did that take any pressure off the joints? No, it protected the teeth. So it's a good splint to protect the teeth, but it does nothing for the jaw or for the muscles. 
So uh, we made a new splint for her, but look at her panoramic image. Look at those condyles. Let me outline them for you because they're not there. This is the neck of the condyle. Where's the golf ball? There's only got a T, you only got a T here. Let's go back, sorry. Same thing here. You only got a little bit of the condyle left. The big ball is gone. Now, the discs are out. These have worn away bilaterally, so she's retruded. She's opened bite because the mandible just shifted back and back and back. And again, as it shifts back, the pressure goes onto the back teeth. Then you get periodontal problems because you got excessive pressure and you, so you get bone loss and then you get excessive loading of the joints that don't have a disc. So what happens is the osteoarthritis and then you get into destruction like this and she's only 48. Um, so again, we did a proper night guard, put her on a flat plane and like we do, like I teach in the course and we'll give you all the details on how to do that. And uh, she just needs protection and maybe reconstruction. We'll see how she goes with time. But for now, it's been a couple of years and she's pretty stable. She's good. She wants to stay as she is. All right. On the MRI, uh, if you're not seeing much, that's normal. There isn't much to see. This is, again, this is the outline of the neck of the condyle. And on the other side, you see the totally, totally flattened out condyle and you can see remnants of the disc way out here. All right, another case. Um, yeah, this one is going through orthodontic treatment, yes. She has active osteoarthritis going on in her left joint. So uh, if we look at her MRIs here, her right side, you can see the outline of the condyle here. You can see the outline of the condyle here in the open mouth. So this is closed mouth, this is open mouth, and we know the difference because the condyle here is within the fossa, and the condyle here is underneath the eminence, okay? Now that's something we're gonna take a minute to reflect. Now the disc is way out here. So now you have a condyle rubbing against an eminence. Now let's go back a sec. Here you have a round condyle in a round fossa. So what you're actually getting is a lot of contact surface. So even if in closed mouth, the disc isn't there, you've got a lot of surface to hold the pressure. As the condyle, however, goes down the eminence, you come into the other situation. Let's look at the screen again. You have a concave, a convex surface, I'm sorry, a convex surface against another convex surface. So you get a small point of contact. So instead of having a lot of surface for contact, you get just a small point. This is conducive to degradation. The pressure per square millimeter here is a hundred times as high as it is when the condyle is in the fossa. So you don't want the condyle down there without protection. Now, let's look at what happens on the other image. Now, this is the right side. Let's go down to the left side. And you can see the outline of the condyle here, but you see no, no cortical layer. There's a great big hole from there to there. And when did that happen? Well, let's look at the open mouth. And here is where it all disappeared. The disc is way out here. The eminence is there. And the absence of cortex is here. If you, if you can imagine a cortical layer here, you can see that it would be rubbing against the eminence. So the pressure at that point actually totally destroyed the cortex of the condyle there. So she's presently in treatment with her night guard. And by using the proper night guard, by rebalancing the bite on the night guard, she's wearing it as much as she can. We're actually taking some load off the joint. You can't, you can't distract a joint with a night guard, but you can, act, you can actually take some load off of it. And it's a nasty, and it's a, um, it's a principle of orthopedics. If you have osteoarthritis in your joints, in the knee or in the hip, they tell you to take some pressure off the joints and give nature a chance to heal. Well, it's the same here. And we've had well, uh, pretty good success. Actually, about two-thirds of the patients, we've published that in the Journal of Contemporary Dental Practice a couple of years ago, 
uh, we have pretty good success, but two thirds of the patients see adaptation of the bony structures. So you actually can see reformation of the cortical layer of the condyle just by having a little bit less pressure and letting nature do its job. You're actually giving it a chance to heal by taking some pressure off of it. Heal or adapt, I should say. It's not true healing, it's an adaptation. All right. So another case. Um, this is a periodontal problem. This patient came in. Again, you can see the short rami. You can see it's shorter on her left side. You can see the chin is shifted to her left. Um, you can see here that there's not, not much wear and tear on the teeth per se, but the bone took a beating. Now, if you look at her left condyle, you can see it's very small. Right condyle is pretty normal. Left condyle is pretty small. It's actually lower than the coronoid process, which is not normal. They should be at least equal, or the, actually, theoretically, the condyle should be higher than the coronoid process. And um, she has severe mobility of her molars. Now, there's no tartar down there. It's not a direct periodontal infection. The mobility in her molars does not come from inflammation from plaque and tartar, not in her case. Her mouth is beautiful, her mouth is clean. She's had, she has perfect hygiene, but she has a little bit of bone loss and she has mobility. Mobility is actually strong mobilities in her, lower, in her lower molars because there's excessive pressure in her lower molars on her left side, I should say. It should be, it's these three molars here. So, the left side lower molars all have mobility due to the fact that they're excessively loaded. Again, we did the night guard, eventually did the bite adjustment, and she's doing much better, and the teeth did solidify. Let's go to the next, the next case. This case is interesting, and it's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking, because this is a female dentist. This is a young female dentist. Um, she gave me permission, of course. I'm not going to name her, but she gave me permission to use the images. All, all the images you see, by the way, I have signed permission to use the images. Um, so she's here, what, age nine, approximately, and you can see her deep bite, her malocclusion, and everything going on. You can see she's retrusive. You can see she breathes through her mouth. You can see... Uh, the palate's thin, she's not breathing through her nose, the nostrils are thin. Uh, you can not only see the mandibular problems, you can see the airway problems. And I'm, I haven't talked much about airway yet, but this is a perfect case to illustrate. Um, airway is a, is a hot subject now. Our airway is a really hot subject nowadays. And I'm really happy about that. I mean, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't have time to start treating, doing the, uh, the mandibular advancement devices and treating these patients, but it's great that it's a hot topic because there are a lot of patients with these problems, and this was one of them. Um, and airway problems come from the thin palate and allergies and adenoids and tonsils and everything. But airway problems also come from non-developing non joints. When the joints don't develop or when they eventually degrade and the ramus becomes shorter, the airway becomes smaller. So this is one of the origins of airway problems. It's not the only one. The others are there. But this is also one of the important origins of airway problems. Now, when, if you do the three courses and you understand how the joint is and, and pathology of the joint, you're going to see that when a patient, even though they have a short ramus and a small airway, if that disc is out of place and the condyles are wearing down, it's not the best time to do mandibular advancement device and bring that condyle down underneath the eminence and create a pressure situation that's just going to get those condyles to degrade even more, uh, or at least be at risk. And if they do degrade even more, you're going to have to advance the mandible even more to get the, that airway open. So uh, a MAD device is possibly not the best type of device when you understand what's going on in the joint when those joints are osteoarthritic. There are other situations too, we're, we're gonna to skip that for now. Uh, that's not the point of the lecture, of course. 
So let's get back to this touching case. Um, so this is her very young and she had uh, phase one orthodontics and then she had phase two. But look at how the dentist was unable to get the, the teeth to couple in front. Um, she so retreated, they had to over overcompensate and they have to overstretch uh, down here to get to get the teeth almost to come together. You can see how the maxilla is going up and the lower teeth are trying to follow, but they're not catching up. And so she's over extruded everywhere. And it's just not, and look at her, her profile pictures. You can see she's still fully retruded. The, you know, the, 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 ramus be, the ramus being short creates an open angle. And then you get very a very long distance from the chin to the tip of the teeth. And you, you see those patients, but that's how that happens. Um, so anyways, she went through phase two. She was happy with her smile. The smile looks nice. I mean, the teeth are straight. Uh, but then what happened is that she kind of relapsed and she did a second ortho treatment with orthognathic surgery this time to try and compensate for the whole thing. So she went through that. They took out a few bicuspids, and now this looks much better. This is a much better looking smile, much more coupled. So this is a very good orthodontic surgical case. I mean, they, they, they did it to perfection. I mean, it's perfectly beautiful. However, how did the patient get to that initial stage? How did she get to that retruded mandible in the first place? The discs were out of place. The condyles did not grow. She has non-reducing discs on both sides. So they corrected the problem here, but they didn't correct one of the sources of the problem. So she relapsed. And even though she had all this surgery, and if you look at the image now, you can see there's no condyle left. Now we're in 2019. She's, she's uh, 28 or 29, 28 years old at this point. No condyle left on her left side and almost no condyle left on her right side. So she relapsed again. She comes to me in pain and she's a dentist. She's fresh out of dental school and she does not understand. She does not have a clue of what's going on in her mouth. Why did she have to go through a second orthodontic treatment? Why did she have to go through surgery? Why is this beautiful work relapsing again? Um, a few months ago, I gave a lecture uh, on exactly that. And, I, and in these free intro lectures, you have that lecture. It's called um, Joint Problems in Orthodontics. And we, I go through just a bunch of these cases. And I give that lecture a few months ago, and, and I had like 2,400 people that registered. Um, and uh, about 40 orthodontists were there, and I was happy about that because they, they're starting to get an understanding that people don't walk in with crooked teeth. They walk in with bad jaws and bad joints. And that has to be addressed as well as the problem in the front. It's not just correct what the bite looks like. It's correct the whole system and make sure it doesn't happen again, doesn't relapse as much as we can, as much as we can prevent it from happening again. You can't prevent all the cases from relapsing, but you can certainly advise the patient of the risk. And if it happens, then you'll know what to do and you'll at least understand what's been going on. All right. So on her MRI, you can see that uh, on her right side, there, the, the condyle is there with a big hole in it here. The disc is totally degraded, flattened out. It, actually, when the disc is out of place, it's not nourished anymore. And if you remember, the disc is nourished by the synovial fluid. When the disc is totally out of place like that, there's no nourishment anymore. So it eventually just dries out. It shrinks away and it's, it just dries out. And on the open mouth view, you can see the condyle is underneath the eminence point-to-point -point contact that's creating degradation there. That's what's creating the hole in the condyle here. Um, on the left joint, again, totally flattened out. No more cortex, cortex left there. Disc is way out here. Open mouth, bone to bone. And these have flattened out. This is osteoarthritis. And she's 29. 
She's not 72, she's 20, 28. Um, so eventually uh, she came to the night guard course. She did her own night guard. She wore it for three years. This was pre-COVID, so she, uh, yeah, we're not talking about COVID much more uh, anymore, much anymore. We're post-COVID now. So uh, this was pre-COVID. And she uh, made her own night guard, worked for three years. Then she came to the bike course, the, the occlusion course. And uh, I said, hey, hi, how, how have you been? And she said, I'm better. I'm much better. I'm feeling a lot better. Things have stabilized. I'm not. My bite isn't shifting anymore. And she said, "Can you? this is the equilibration course. Can you do my equilibration? So I checked her out, and she was stable. And I checked her night guard, and so we did the equilibration as a demonstration for the for the other students. And uh, even though she was wearing a night guard, the daytime her bite was totally off, and she was uncomfortable, and she had tension in her muscles all day. Very fragile. And uh, the next morning, uh, at the course, the next morning after we did the equilibration, said, "So how was your muscles?" She said, "Number one, I slept like a baby." But number two, I have no tension. I have breakfast and I have no tension in my muscles this morning. And I said, well, great. And I hope it stays stable. And I've seen her a couple of times since. It's been stable because she took the time to stabilize her joints with the night guard for a period of three years before we did the bite adjustment. And she, we, we proved stability in the joints before we did anything permanent to the dentition. And that's the principle. You have to prove that the joints are stable before you do anything major in the mouth. So before you do orthodontics, before you do, you do surgery, before you do major rehab, or before you do a bite adjustment, you want to make sure that the joints are stable, or else if they're not, and it changes in the foundation, everything is going to change. And the patient's not going to be happy, and you're all going to be frustrated. And we don't want that, don't we? Okay. So... Case number 10, uh, I'm often told that uh, osteoarthritis in the young patient only happens in females. Well, not true, it happens in males too. Much more frequent in females, but it does happen in males too. So 23-year-old patient, uh, panoramic, panoramic image doesn't look so bad. I mean, he's had ortho. Uh, not much space here between the condyle and the fossa. Same here, not much space there probably lost his discs. Mouth looks okay. I mean, the bite's not too bad. I mean, it's okay. It's a, it's a, it's a good orthodontic treatment. But um, he had pain and he had tension and we did a night guard. But as he had the night guard, he developed an open bite. And because um, he was his jaws didn't grow very much and he was lacking space for his tongue. So with the night guard in place, well, he was lacking even more space. So the tongue protruded a little bit and he got that a little bit of an open bite. So before we let that get out of hand, we made a galb appliance to help reintrude the teeth. Now making the galb appliance, this, the teeth reintruded a little bit, but not much. We didn't, we didn't get back to what we wanted to. Uh, and we MRI'd and we realized that from 2017 to 2018, the right joint had degraded. And from 2017 to 2018, the left joint got better. So even though he was wearing a proper night guard, the night guard I do all the time, the night guard that created reduction of pressure on the joints, on his left side, he did get better, but the right side actually got worse. So uh, these osteoarthritic, osteoarthritic, and actually it's kind of avascular necrosis going on there, these damages can happen even though you're treating the patient, and you have to advise the patients. He's looking at possible grafting or total joint replacement or something like that. Um, some cases you can control, in some cases you can't. Uh, I'm going to do two other cases and then we'll, we'll stop there because we have pretty much what we want. I, I've done pretty much what I wanted to do with you today. Um, so this is a young lady. Uh, she had orthodontics and orthognathic surgery, but only of the mandible to correct an open bite. 
And you can see that there's no space here between the condyle and the fossa, probably lost their disc. Here the condyle is small, it's lower than the coronoid process. <clears throat> so again, the disc is probably displaced. And she totally relapsed after surgery. And you can see the overjet she has here, and it's just humongous. So this is another uh, orthognathic case again. But we first did an eye guard. We had had her on an eye guard for two years before she went and had that corrected again. So then if you look at the right joint here, you can see that the cortex is there. The disc is totally out, but at least the cortex is there. But on the left joint, condyle, a disc is out, but there's no cortex left. So see, she's actively degrading. So when she came to us, she was actually actively degrading, and that's why she relapsed. So we did the night guard for, for a while, and then she had another orthodontic treatment, and then uh, surgery, and I've been following her for the last couple of years. And now she's good, and she's stable, and she's happy. And no more morning headaches, and she's just happy because, you know, when you have that open bite and the retruded mandible, you get pressure on those teeth and pressure on those muscles, and they're not working in coordinated pairs, and she had headaches. All right, so last case. This is another young patient, 22-year-old female with retruded jaw. And you can see that retruded jaw, but that is three years post-orthognathic surgery. So another relapse case. And again, she came to us with an open bite. We did a night guard. The open bite continued to progress as her joints continued to degrade eventually stabilized, eventually went back to ortho again uh, and got corrected. Now you can see March 2016 and November 2016, she's way open by December 2016, we had a little bit of bettering of the situation, but uh, we're not, with a night guard, I'm not, or even with a gallop, I'm not going to get that to close. So she went to the orthodontist and eventually got it closed once it had stabilized. Now, uh, on her panoramic image here, you can see that there's absolutely no space between the condyles and the fossas, fossae. Um, on the MRI, 2014, uh, you can see that there is no cortical layer here, nice cortex here, no cortical layer here, nice cortex here, which is a uh, year a little bit more than a year, like 14 months later. So the she walked in with actively degrading joints. With, she's 22. She walked in with active osteoarthritis going on. And with the night guard, that stabilized in both joints. We were blessed. We were happy that that happened. Um, so the joints stopped degrading, and that's when she stabilized. And that's she stayed on that protocol for another couple of years, then went to the orthodontics and got herself corrected again. And we followed her until recently, 2023, and she is now very, very stable. And we actually, ha I don't know if we have it in this lecture, but we have another MRI from 2021, which proves that she's, no, we don't have it here, not a problem. But we've proven, we've demonstrated that she's still stable within her condyles. Now, that kind of completes uh, that introduction lecture for today. Uh, so who needs a splint and why? Well, we've seen all sorts of reasons here. Now, we've seen patients that uh, destroy their mouth and need a night guard to protect. We've seen patients with relapse after ortho. We've seen patients that had periodontal problems. We've seen patients with lost teeth and breaking down dentitions and worn, very severely worn dentitions. We saw all sorts of situations that you will see every day in your practice. And we've related those situations and that destruction to what was going on in the foundation in the joint. And so that's the introduction that leads you to starting to understand who needs a night guard. So if we start reflecting on what we said at the beginning, what are the signs of wear and tear in a patient's mouth? What's the percentage of patients that you have that have no sign of wear and tear, that don't have any excessive forces going on?
I mean, there are some, but they're not that many. Well, in your practice, you tell me. I mean, my practice may be different from yours. Now, this course was created to understand what's going on and to be able to act upon it. So, uh, if you liked it enough, you can enroll for the course now. You can watch the other videos. But I hope I've given you enough to understand what's the importance of understanding what's going on and to be able to do something for it. So, have a good day.